it is usually best to admit mistakes when they occur, and to seek to restore honor. When I'm through with you kids, the window won't be the only thing that's broken! But not this time. Run! If you'd like to commission a knick-knack sample platter, instructions in the description below. The older I get, the more distaste I have for filler as a term for television, because I think it demeans the hard work of the people making the show, and the episodes people say are filler almost never actually are. The term has a lot of uses, of course. Filler is what dentists pack into a cavity. For the media use of the term, it probably evolved from print newspaper. Not every day has enough major news stories to fill all the page space, so here's a short paragraph about a local dog or something. When television stations started running 24 hours a day, they needed cheap, easy filler for the late night and midday hours when very few people were watching, so here's a bunch of infomercials and syndicated reruns. To say an episode of television is filler is to suggest that it was something made quick and cheap to fill the predetermined episode order. But that's rarely the case. The only kind of episode that I would argue fits that definition is the clip show episode. There are bottle episodes, of course, in which the production uses tricks to reduce production costs, but those still require effort from the writers and the cast, and the best ones are often powerhouse character pieces. So it's, it's just weird to me that everywhere I look, the single best episode of Avatar The Last Airbender is called a filler episode. The Tales of Ba Sing Se is the 15th episode of The Last Airbender's second season, the 35th episode overall, originally airing on September 29th, 2006. Directed by Ethan Spaulding, who also did The Blind Bandit, another episode we covered, The Tales of Ba Sing Se does break the usual episode format, presenting six short tales focusing on different members of the main cast. The episode takes place after our heroes, Aang, Katara, Sokka, and Toph have arrived in the Earth Kingdom capital of Ba Sing Se and are attempting, and failing, to talk to the Earth King about the war. Their trusty Sky Bison, Appa, is missing, and they can't do anything at the moment but twiddle their thumbs. Meanwhile, Prince Zuko and his uncle Iroh are in hiding in the city, working at a tea shop and disguising their Fire Nation heritage. In the tale of Toph and Katara, the two girls of the group go out for a makeover at the local spa, which Toph is initially not receptive to and is a bit of a troll to the staff there. However, it is relaxing, and for all her rude and rough tom girl edge, there is a part of Toph who enjoys feeling feminine and pretty, but that also comes with insecurities. I don't care what I look like. I'm not looking for anyone's approval. I know who I am. That's what I really admire about you, Toph. You're so strong and confident and self-assured. And I know it doesn't matter, but you're really pretty. I am? Yeah, you are. In the tale of Iroh, we see him walking around the market, preparing for something and helping those he comes across. From a wilting flower, to a crying child, to a down-on-his-luck beggar. This is so great. No one has ever believed in me. While it is always best to believe in oneself, a little help from others can be a great blessing. We then discover that Iroh is preparing a ceremony of remembrance for his late son, who died in an earlier Fire Nation campaign to take this very city. The short ends with a tribute to Iroh's voice actor, Mako Iomatsu, who passed away a few months before the episode's airing. In the tale of Aang, the Avatar is still frustrated about losing Appa, and when he sees the poor state of the local zoo, he makes it his mission to move all these animals to a preserve outside the city. Hey, he's best friends with Appa and the flying lemur Momo. Don't worry, I'm great with animals. <laughs> Yeah, it's a chaotic mess, but eventually Avatar gets all the animals outside and uses his new skills in earthbending to make them their new home. In the tale of Sokka, the brash young man has a haiku rap battle with a poetry society. There's nuts and there's fruits. In fall, the clinging plum drops. Always to be squashed. Squish, squash, sling that slang. I'm always right back at you, Like my... Boomerang.
In the tale of Zuko, the former Fire Nation prince is paranoid about his current situation and thinks a girl named Jin, who frequents the tea shop, is a spy. In fact, she has a crush on the young man, and with Iroh's prodding, the two go out on a date. Zuko is awkward, his defenses are high, but the two nonetheless find a connection. I brought you something. It's a coupon for a free cup of tea. Lee, this is so sweet. Don't thank me. It was my uncle's idea. He thinks you're our most valuable customer. Your uncle is a good teacher. Finally, in the tale of Momo, the flying lemur is looking around the city for Appa, but runs into three pygmy pumas who are looking for a meal. There's a chase, and all four animals are captured by some local butchers. Momo breaks them all out, hooray, they're friends now, and the pumas lead Momo to one of Appa's giant footprints in the city. The main reason this episode is called filler is because it doesn't move the current plot arc forward, but instead takes its time to explore and develop the main characters. A site like TV Tropes will be quick to point out that the term filler doesn't mean bad, and I'm sure many people feel that way. But it really is a value judgment. In this instance, it is creating a distinction between plot and character and saying that plot is of higher value. Focusing on characters is given the same name as when people put sawdust into bread to give it volume. But the things we learn about these characters are vital for the story and the show would be much lesser without them. We get affirmation of Toph's insecurities, that while her tough pro wrestler exterior is very much a part of her, it is only the front facing part of her. And that's important because the show only introduced Toph nine episodes earlier. Aang's adventures let us know where he's at in both terms of developing his superpowers and his maturity, which is still fairly childlike in how easily things get out of hand. Zuko's date is one of the first times he lets his defenses down even a little bit, one of the first times anyone outside of his uncle have shown him true kindness and compassion, setting him up for his rise and fall and rise again as the series progresses. Iroh's tale affirms what a morally centered man he is, and gives us an example of how to live outside of war, grieving for his son but having no animosity for the nation he died fighting in. Sokka's story is the slightest, but it does show us how quick Sokka is able to adapt to his surroundings, while also reinforcing his pig-headedness. We're in the middle of the middle season, and the episode does a fantastic job, occasionally heart-wrenching job, demonstrating how these characters are in the middle of their personal arcs. How is that less valuable than the plot? And this isn't a bottle episode. The animation is still in top form, there are action scenes, it's not just dialogue. If anything, this would have been harder to produce because each story was written by a different person. And in an interesting twist, these were all people from other parts of the production besides the writer's room. Toph and Katara, written by production coordinator Joanne Estoesta, and martial arts coordinator Lisa Wallander. Ira was written by production manager Andrew Hubner. Aang was written by production assistant Gary Shepke. Sokka was written by director Lauren McMullen. Zuko was written by production assistant Katie Matilla. And Momo was written by storyboard artists Justin Ridge and Giancarlo Volpe. It's a shame this isn't one of the episodes with a DVD commentary, because I'd love to know the process of wrangling all these stories up and how much work was done to tie them all together. The finalized episode suggests a bunch of really talented people on the same page as to what they were making, as none of these stories mischaracterize our protagonists. And on top of it all, this is a tribute to Mako. After Mako's passing, the role was taken over by Greg Baldwin, who also took over Mako's role as a coup on Samurai Jack. Baldwin does a lot of convention work, and the one request that he won't do is sing Iroh's song from this episode, Leaves from the Vine, one of the last things Mako ever recorded. Leaves from the vine, falling so slow, like fragile tiny shells drifting in the foam, little so Come marching home, brave soldier boy, comes marching home. Art is not worthy just because it moves a story forward. There is value in stillness, value in reflection, value in quiet. When these moments of reflection, of learning, of listening happen in our own lives, they're not wastes of time. They're not filler. 
their texture and emotion and meaning. Cherish them while they're here.